Thanks for that introduction, Chrissy, and uh, good morning to everybody. Thanks for sitting in and listening to our presentation. Great, as always, to follow up after John with his fantastic perspective on, on nuclear and the industry over many, many decades. I still remember fondly the first time I met John in Darba 2006 when I was head of corporate development for Mitsubishi development and we were looking at getting into uranium. Um, I think what John didn't realize at the time is I did have a little bit of insight into Langer Heinrich because Langer Heinrich was drilled out by one of the South African companies that I worked for as a, as a young mining engineer and um, it was, uh, I actually met the geologist who drilled it out. Uh, I'd never heard of Langer Heinrich, and um, it had just been sold to a claim the, the, who John bought uh, the deposit off, off a claim. And uh, this fellow, Joe Hartlieb, was very nonplussed by the fact that Jane Call and Billiton had had the audacity to sell Langer Heinrich. I'd never heard the word before, and I said, Joe, what's, what, what's the buzz? And I never forgot his words. He said, Greg, mark my words. Nuclear's time will come and Langer will be one of the first of the new generation uranium mines to be developed. And John delivered on that promise, so fantastic history there. Uh, bring it closer to home to us, Oro, draw your attention to the usual disclaimer. Then I'm going to take a slightly different path to what I've historically done with my presentations, is I've kind of like taken a step back, thinking about, okay, why would anybody be interested in uranium? And, and, and clearly John's covered some of, the, 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 of my topic there, but I might bring a slightly different perspective. And then specifically US uranium, given that that's where our project is located. And then finally, I'll hone in on exactly the asset itself and what we're up to and why we think it is a compelling investment opportunity. So I guess you could summarize, apart from what John said, I, I, I think about in, in, in three or four different ways in terms of the uranium market. So we've got price and what we've seen just in the last few years, and in particular this year, energy security issues globally, the path towards net zero, which John obviously covered, and then finally thinking about price and inventory depletion what impact that is happening, having on price and on the aspiring producers. So start off with spot. Uh, it's up something like 67 odd percent this year alone. I can't recall many other uh, commodities going up that much. I guess you could think about lithium uh, earlier this year, but of course as quickly as it went up, it, it tanked again and went dramatically down. So that's the, the other thing. The other thing is there's a 34 odd percent shortfall for this year's supply alone and that's only going to get worse. So that's really interesting. You say, okay, well, how do we keep the lights on as far as a nuclear power station is concerned when your supply is under threat? And the offset to that is contracting volumes are currently at 10-year highs, and that sends a very clear signal that the utilities are no longer prepared to just rely on spot supply. The second point I mentioned was energy security. So nuclear and uranium is effectively a bifurcated market. You can see the sources of uranium supply and where they located, the big blue bubbles, and the greater sources of demand, the big yellow bubbles. And you can see there's a clear differentiation between the two. And that brings its own inherent challenges in particular over the last two years with Russia's illegal invasion of the Ukraine. So that sensitivity around energy security has been hammered home in, in the most obscene fashion with that war. The people realize we've got to look after ourselves in, in your, 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 your hemisphere, be it north, south, east or west. The next one is towards net zero, and, and John mentioned this in some, some detail. I'd recommend trying to catch the, the, the movie by Oliver Stone, Nuclear Now, to create, uh, to get some really good sense of perspective on the history of how we got to where we are today and why nuclear became, coin phrase, I guess, disenfranchised over the years, but now very much back on the scene. John's addressed some of those points there, uh, and it really is important. He spoke about heating just briefly. Don't misunderstand what he's saying. That's not keeping your home warm at night, although people in Germany did, did die in Christmas last year because they could not afford their energy bills. 
because they turned off perfectly good nuclear power stations. What he's talking about is industrial heating. And the very well-regarded environmental scientist uh, from Fraser Nash, Ben Hurd, said last week at the Uranium Conference, if you think that electricity decarbonization is difficult, we haven't even started on the major challenge, which is industrial heating. Germany, having spent 500 billion euros on, on trying to transition, would need to spend them three times that amount to try and address their heating industrial requirements because they have very large chemical industries. Right, inventory de depletion. I did a bit of nuclear, uh, a, a bit of mineral economics as a young man, and, and, and so I try to think of has the uranium market ever been driven by rational economics? And the answer is no. And it's always been driven by other issues up until recently. Now, all of a sudden, we are on a path where, yes, this has been driven by rational economics, where there needs to be a sufficient price attached to the commodity to elicit additional supply. And we're getting close, 75 for some. I think most of us would be looking at something well north of $80 a pound. Right, so US uranium, let's move closer to, I guess, where we're operating. Um, you know, so first of all, the US is the world's largest, or has the world's largest nuclear fleet, and is by definition, therefore, the world's largest uranium consumer. And it's remained fairly stagnant, despite the fact that they've shut down nuclear power stations over the years, but it's largely been 40 to 45 million pounds for the last 40 odd years. But they have no domestic production. Not only do they have no domestic production, but also, when you interrogate where the uranium comes from, 2021 it was over 50% from former CIS countries, uh, Russian included, and last year it was just below 50%, I think 48%. So here's this weird situation where they reliant on, and, and the Kazakhs and the Uzbeks are clearly not our enemies, but the fact that their product goes through Russia creates all sorts of issues at a moral level and at a strategic level, and that needs to be addressed. Then domestic production has also barely, barely there. You know, this year we may see a few hundred thousand pounds, and we'll be hearing from Wayne Hale a little bit later from Peninsula today. You, you might, if you know the story, seen the challenges he's faced to get his really compelling little, uh, ISR operation up and running. So here we are in this dramatic inventory depletion phase, really emphasised by the situation in the U.S. So what the US has done is they've recognized this opportunity that there is the path to net zero is definitely reinforcing and reestablishing their nuclear business and building on their existing fleet. So they've got huge commitments, large programs in place to keep the lights on with the existing nuclear thought that was me for it, with the, with the existing um, uh, nuclear power plants, but also new build, new build Small modular reactor developments, yes, we saw some bad news coming out of New Scale last week, which is, or two weeks ago, which is in Portland. That's the same as the two very large wind turbine projects that also did not go ahead for similar reasons in the US. So before politicians get ahead of themselves and say, ah, there, the SMRs are just a pipe dream, nonsense. There's hundreds of different developments ongoing in, in SMRs. And as I say, there's other challenges in going clean and green, not just nuclear versus renewables. The other point I'd like to emphasize is that in the US, apart from bipartisan support, which is the first in many, many decades, if not ever, is that it got huge levels, the highest ever levels of, of public support. And in fact, funnily enough, that is kind of reflected all over the world. You may be surprised to hear that Yes, in Germany and in Australia as well, there is more public support for nuclear than what the politicians would have us believe. And there are certain implications of that as we look forward into the future and how we decarbonize and how we provide for our energy security. So right, on to Aurora ourselves. First of all, it's great to start with scale. And uh, you know, you start with something big, makes your life easier. So we have, and I did choose my words carefully and with Chrissy's introduction, the largest mineable measured and indicated uranium deposit. 
Why I can say that is because Coles Hill, which is the largest, is in Virginia. They've had a 40-year moratorium on uranium mining. They have nuclear power. They have coal mining, I know, because I visited those coal mines as a young man back in the 90s. Um, but, yeah, no go when it comes to uranium mining. It's a bit more difficult to unwind that compared to, say, unwinding this silly little issue we have in WA about mining uranium. So, you know, greater chance of delivering your, your, your mine in, in WA or permitting WA rather than, than, than in Virginia. So there we are. So we've got the large resource. But it's not always just about scale. Obviously, quality comes into it as well. And we look to a smaller part of the resource, which is particularly high-grade and shallow, for that style of mineralization and that style of deposit. So there we are in southeast Oregon. We also benefit from really good infrastructure. Why do we have that infrastructure? Well, it was a historical mining district for some 70 years. It came to an end about the 19 late 19, early 1990s. So we benefit from that infrastructure. I mentioned the high-grade core sitting right at surface, so easy to mine. Um, also, because of that infrastructure, part of the infrastructure is hydroelectricity, so clean, green, cost-effective, reliable, and, uh, and, and cheap uh, electricity. The other thing that we th believe we can do is we can beneficiate the ore, and that would give us uh, about a, a 70% mass pool, so 30% reject of the low-grade material uh, with 90% recovery of the uranium. And that enhances your economics because it drives down your processing costs. So that's a, a big win, and most of us aspire to do that. I know certainly the Tumas flow sheet includes a, a really good, well-designed uh, beneficiation step um, with lots of evidence that it works back from the Langer Heinrich days. We also have what we call this pathway to development, a very clearly defined pathway to development, and that's to take full advantage of different permitting regimes in the two different states, Nevada and Oregon, but also, more importantly, to take advantage of that infrastructure uh, that, that I mentioned. Uh, so we bought 410 acres, US speak, Imperial once again, Chrissy, uh, 410 acres in the US on the border, eight Ks as the crow flies from the deposit, and the, the substation with the hydroelectric power line is right there on the corner of that. It's flat, it's a sealed road that comes from the small town of McDermott close by, and the US 95 major highway passes through that town. So accessibility for reagents, if everything is, is certainly there. So that, that, that object or, or that uh, objective of ours of taking advantage of the infrastructure certainly is a win. As a throwaway comment, we also have lithium in the overlying sediments. That's not a, uh, oh, well, we've also got lithium. Look at us. It's kind of, yes, we've got the lithium, but the focus is the uranium, and we've recently done a transaction where we've uh, basically given an option to another uh, Aussie junior to pursue our lithium so that we can focus on the, uh, on the uranium. Radio. Briefly, as I'm closing, so here we have the corporate snapshot, in case you were waiting and wondering whether I was going to list it and mention it at all. Uh, there's the Muggs Gallery with, with the three board members and our company secretary. All of us very experienced, both in terms of US, uranium, and corporate as well. So good depth of experience within the organization, um, good balance on, on the share register of the original uh, project development group that acquired the project, um, as well as some of the major, three in fact, of the major U, um, uranium-focused investment funds in the world are on our register and are very supportive. That being said, with that particular share price and that kind of low valuation leads me to my concluding slide that, you know, there's plenty of upside in this particular project and in the company from the jurisdiction, the infrastructure, the fundamental quality of the asset, and the people driving it as well. And the closing mark goes to that as well. So think about this, because this is what we need to turn around in terms of the world's perspective on where you get your energy from. Aurora and our colleagues in the industry throughout the world can deliver via the uranium the clean, sustainable future that we deserve. Thank you very much for your attention.